Uh, welcome to Lambda Bible Studies, and joining me is Niv. Uh, how are you doing, Niv? Welcome to the Hey, show. yeah. Doing all right, although just before this, I told you everything in the house is going wrong, so that's quite fun, but hopefully all fixable. <laughs> well, we were just, before we went live, you were showing me this this website, because I normally have Bible Gateway up, but this is hmm. this looks much better. So you, what, what are you telling me about? If I click sure. Shining, so, what do I get? It, yeah, brilliant. So this calls Scripture Tools for Every Person. I think that's what it stands for, stepbible.org. <laughs> Step, right. I know. It's come out of Tyndale House, which is based in Cambridge. What's brilliant about it is it's got all these different translations and ancient editions linked in. So you can just see where's a word being used in Scripture, click through to see uh -huh. where else it's being used. It kind of gives you concordance tools uh, and all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, I really recommend it because I, th I think it, it helps me kind of engage with loads of different bits of original language, etc., cetera, um, in quite a convenient place. So I, I kind of recommend it to everyone because it's free. Great. So the, the topic for this evening is angels. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the meme that's happened online of biblically accurate angels. Right? Yeah, I was hoping you talk about it. Which which is usually, I think, based on that bit from, is it Ezekiel with the wheels within wheels? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then at the, at the other end, of, at the other extreme of, I guess, cultural assimilation of what an angel is, you go to a nativity play. Yes. And you might have like, you know, basically a, a girl with, with wings and a, a, a wand. It's basically a fairy. It's like half, halfway between a fairy and a... I guess there's there's some way I don't know historically how we think of that as an angel. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess let's start with what what does the Bible say? What what is an angel? Yeah, brilliant question. One of the things I think is really remarkable about the Bible is that it's not going to answer the questions I have in the form I always expect. So perhaps the first place you'd go to to look for angels might be where we've got scripture. Uh, open to Genesis 1 thinking oh they're created they're created beings let's look for them in the creation account and you won't find them mentioned in, in Genesis 1 or, or 2 um, you will find references to angels being present at creation you know Job where the Lord speaks to, to Job and says you know where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth and the sons of the morning shouted for joy that's a beautiful des description of the angels um, but actually if you want to look at a kind of almost definition of what angels are, you get that all the way through the scriptures later on in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter one, probably the most important chapter for what an angel is, although there are loads and loads of references to them. Um, and what's really curious about this is that you find out about angels in the context of who the son of God is, the second person of the Trinity. Um, so, I mean, the ESV helpfully says supremacy of God's son. It's in the context of figuring out who Jesus is that we learn the most we learn about angels. We learn later on in that chapter, you can scroll down to see that they are ministering spirits, um, but they do not have that unique position of sonship. They do not receive uh, worship from, from anyone, but they are servants of God's purposes. Um, what's interesting there is that the writer of the Hebrews is, is collating lots of verses from the Old Testament. So this isn't something he's making up this is clearly something that that his readers would have been familiar with and he's using it to kind of buttress his argument if angels are this big a deal and they are how much more the son to whom god will say um that bit from from psalm uh, 45 your throne O god uh, is forever and ever you know it, it's in the context of the son's unique glory that we learn the most we learn about angels, which is why one of the things I'll say about them is that angels are exegetically elusive. They're there in all kinds of scripture passages, sometimes in narratives. They're doing things. They appear. Um, I mentioned how in Genesis 1 and 2, you don't meet angels. You start meeting them in places like uh, Genesis Oh, that's a nice comment. You start meeting them in places like Genesis uh, 18, where Abraham is meeting the Lord and the Lord is accompanied by these men, these, these figures who, who clearly later on will, will, will start to think that they must be messengers uh, from God. But we don't get all the details right now. This one is an angel and look at its wings. Uh, far from it. Yeah. Sorry. Obviously, I could go on with more there. Helpful, perhaps, just to have said the word for angel is just messenger. Uh, Malach, I guess, in the Old Testament and Angelos in Greek. And so in one sense, 
There are even bits in the Bible where people are called angels, and it's not clear whether they are these spiritual heavenly beings or not. Classic example, Revelation uh, 1 to 3 talks about the angels of churches. And some people would think those are like the bishops of the church, the ministers of the church. Others would think they are the sort of spiritual beings associated with the church. Um, let's pause there because I've said a lot. Thoughts or want more? Or, uh, yeah. Well, I, I was just musing on the fact that, that Hebrews opens up with, I'm going to try and explain to you who Jesus is by comparing him to... A, a species of being which you also don't really understand <laughs> yes yes but then th this is the whole this is the whole concept is difficult to grab onto we're, we're kind of reaching a little bit beyond human abilities and we only have these glimpses right mm. and i think pe people are very keen to especially a certain type of person to categorize everything and you, you mm -hmm. treat the angels mm -hmm. almost like you're studying you know, like little boys learn about dinosaurs, and then they, yes. they want to they, they want to have a tree where they can place everything and understand the mm -hmm. relations. So you you have ideas that there's exactly seven types of angels or whatever it is. How, yes. how much how much detail do you think we can get? How I guess uh, the conclusions that you've reached about the the nature of angels do you hold do you hold it with great clarity and you feel you you. You, you could detail it down to the nth degree or are yeah. you also sort of, sort of approaching some something that feels far off? Brilliant question. I think oh, there's so many inroads into that question. One of them would be that a bit like Hebrews 1, just throwing angels into the picture, whether I know about them or not, there's a sense in which I have to reckon with the reality of angels even when I don't understand them. So context mm -hmm. you're listening. I'm an ordained minister in the Church of England. And so one of the things I will do is I will preside at communion services. And there's like a back and forth response we, we, we go through, which, which has been kind of in Christian DNA when they do the communion for, for centuries, where we're talking about the, the sort of setting, you know, and it's all sorts of stuff like lift up your hearts, lift them up to the Lord. There's a bit, though, where we all start saying the words from Isaiah 6, the holy, holy, holy words. And just before that, the minister will say, uh, therefore, with angels and archangels, praising your name and saying. And so this remarkable thing that, uh, you know, I, I got interested in this because I just realized that angels were all over the Bible I was reading, embedded in the kind of liturgical practice of a worship service, doing all kinds of things. And it almost didn't seem to matter that I couldn't really figure out exactly what they are and exactly what they're doing. Um, so there's a sense in which being an obedient Christian just means acknowledging this level of, of angelic reality that I don't fully grasp. Um, at the same time, there are moments where I think I'm encouraged to go looking for um, that level of, of reality, to kind of uh, be aware that that is something that might be happening. So a couple of examples, 2 Kings 6, there's this amazing moment where um, th there's um, Elisha and he's kind of surrounded by enemies. And one of his kind of servants is quaking, being like, oh, my goodness, the army is so strong. And Elisha has this kind of luminous moment. He goes, don't don't worry. There are more with us than, than are against us. And asks him to open his eyes. And he opens his eyes. He just sees this incredible array of kind of angelic forces, the hosts. Maybe your, your listeners have heard that, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth. Well, hosts meaning armies, angel armies. Another one, though, the other end of the spectrum, away from kind of badass fighting, what happens every time you do hospitality? Well, you're welcoming someone into your space. You're, you're, you're showing them the kindness and the warmth of, of um, I, I suppose, Christian love. One of the things Hebrews 13 says is you might be entertaining angels unawares. I have two little girls and they love having loads and loads of people coming into our home because it's a, it's a ministry home. And one of, one of them, my older one, asked me, why do we have guests? And I sort of said cheekily, because we might be entertaining angels. That's what the Bible says. You just don't know. That's picking up the, the Abraham story, that Abraham has this lavish um, welcome to these to these angelic visitors in Genesis. Uh, and, and it turns out that they were angels, chapter 18. Um, so, so I think there's a sense in which it's for our good that we don't know everything we know about angels. And you can absolutely go wrong by trying to figure out everything about them. Um, so, you know, there's an argument about whether there are seven orders of angels or nine. Um, and I'm I'm very fond of the guy who came up with the idea that there were nine, or at the very least popularised it. He's called Dionysius the Areopagite, or Pseudo-Dionysius, because that's not who he really was. Uh, Acts 17, you might know that there are some people who get converted 
listening to Paul's sermon. And one of them is, is Dionysius uh, and the Areopagus. Uh, it. So basically this uh, uh, 5th century okay. Syrian monk probably writes loads of stuff about angels and about the world and about the cosmos and the relationship to God. And he gives himself the name and the character, kind of LARPing, I suppose, as the Dionysius from the first century. Now, a lot of people did think it was him, but um, that was kind of exploded in the Renaissance. Anyway, I'm very fond of him because actually his instincts were wonderfully Christian. He was dealing with the, the dominant, maybe too strong a word, but the massively persuasive philosophy of Neoplatonism. And he was incorporating some of its best insights into a biblical framework and resolutely correcting some of its more pagan kind of um, outliers. Now, when you read him, you'll find him talking in unbelievable detail about this order of angel, that order of angel. And you don't really know what on earth he's he's, he's talking about because it's not anywhere in scripture to rank <laughs> in the way you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, what he does, which is really helpful, is he talks about how the fact that, that, that angels belong to invisible spiritual reality should change the way we think about them. So that meme about the biblically accurate angel I find that really remarkable because actually we're kind of missing the point when, when we try and draw these pictures. The point is that those are human sense capacities being overwhelmed by a spiritual reality. The same way that the Bible talks about the arm of God and you don't imagine like a really hench bicep floating around the cosmos, but instead you realize <laughs> language is being put to use to talk about a spiritual reality. Actually, when we're talking about wings and then eyes under the wings and wheels within wheels what's going on there is much more about a spiritual power being described a spiritual power that is utterly created so in a sense you and i have more in common with angels than angels have in common with god because god is not created he's the creator um, but in another sense utterly beyond us because we exist as embodied creatures and the angels are without bodies and so they inhabit reality in very different ways um, so, sorry, I don't know if that's a very helpful answer, but basically, I think yeah. we're meant to both. We're meant to have enough mystery that puts us in our place, makes us realize that as human beings, we are limited, but we're also encouraged to see the world as populated by spiritual beings, to recognize that there's much more to everything than time and matter and chance, and to understand that in certain moments, like my worship or my hospitality, actually, it's like there's there's a porous boundary between me and that spiritual world. And I should expect to have angels ascending and descending on this kind of Jacob's ladder of, of, of reality. I, I find that I have a certain um, sort of discomfort or embarrassment talking about angels and demons. Uh, I, I guess I'm comfortable talking about their existence in a theological sense but in my actual day-to-day -day christian yeah. experience it's very rare that, that that's my that's my mode mm. of thinking you know and i don't know if this is a reflection of of the age or, or the kind of christian culture which i've i've grown yeah. up in do, do you find that angels are something that you think of mm. uh, apart from when you are sort of uh reminded of it in in liturgy or, yeah, or, or yeah. such great question do you know what increasingly so um mm -hmm. but only because i've been thinking about it a fair bit recently and i think your your response is is, is a fairly i hope i think let's say common one in western western christendom that actually one of the things that got shunted out of the way at the kind of well whatever you can call it post enlightenment modernity thing was an understanding of that sort of invisible spiritual world. Because if, if you're following a thinker like Occam, for instance, you don't really need that invisible layer of reality to explain a whole lot of what happens in day-to-day -day life. And so angels and demons, etc., they just got scooched over to one side. And that's why when you read someone like I don't know, take Martin Luther, he will talk about these unbelievably vivid encounters with the devil, which kind of make you go, I mean, I'm glad that doesn't seem to happen to me. Right. And today it's very hard for people to, to, to feel like they're that comfortable talking about angels, demons, et cetera. Uh, and so for a lot of Christians, I, I think that's quite normal. I think, hmm, where to begin? A couple of things that are quite interesting here. 
One of them would be that in scripture, angels have a job to do. And so we miss the point if we obsess over them, but we line up with them when we are doing the thing that God's called us to do and therefore find ourselves like colleagues, if you like, in the big organization or whatever metaphor you want to choose. So there's a sense in which I actually think it's not at all crazy to start praying for the Lord to work through his angels or to pick up some of the promises in scripture that he um sends angels to protect his own. There's a very old prayer that I say to my daughters before I put them down to bed. Visit this place, O Lord, we beseech thee, and drive far from it all the snares of the enemy. Let thy holy angels dwell herein to guard us in peace, and may thy blessing be upon us forevermore. Amen. Good prayer. Good prayer, because what it's doing is it's picking up a reality in scripture, which is that almighty God, who needs no help, nonetheless has glory in creating these these powerful and beautiful creatures and sending them to do his work. Um, so that's that's quite, I think, important. Um, but yes, it, it's not something that I think a lot of Christians think about loads. And that's probably because we're afraid of obsessing over it. And that is definitely a possibility. Uh, go to any bookshop, go to their kind of mind, body, spirit section, and you will find all sorts of garbage about angels. And for a lot of people, angels are a kind of comfortable middle ground between secular me and unacceptable God. So that if right. the God theory is just too much to swallow, because actually if there's a God, then I need to change. And, you know, but angels give me that kind of sprinkling of, of, of cosmic fairy dust where there's enough magic and excitement in the world that I could, you know, call out to a supernatural thing, but I don't have to have a Lord. Um, yeah. So I think... <laughs> I was going to say um, angels don't get involved in judgment in the same way that God does. Although, then I thought, in the, again, the popular or um, in, incorrect, I think, um, misconception about what the Bible teaches, people think of hell as being yeah. ruled over by the devil and that there's, there's fallen angels and then mm. they all go and run this sort of, prison colony yes, yes. <laughs> they're, they're torturing people um so i, I guess people have this real strong view that the um the punishment is actually a thing that only evil beings would would do so the, yes, their yes. conception of what an angel is is somebody who would only be helping preventing pain saving people and Correct. they think that they maybe they have a personal angel if they just dodged a car accident it was their guardian angel who steered them around it mm -hmm. um but i think we we should think of angels as being much more sort of full-blooded yes. scary beings that are fighting with god against evil and, mm -hmm. and evil mm -hmm. also needs violent destruction to happen to it so ultimately yes. the 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 picture in the Bible of hell is what mm. God does to yes. evil. It's not, hell is not an institution that was dreamed up by the devil, right? Mm. Yes, you're I, quite I, right. I guess I didn't, I didn't have a question there. That was no, just but, a comment. But, but it's just helpful to draw in, even in what you say, there is obviously a, a significant role in which angels kind of execute the judgment of God. And so you do get that. So that, for instance, I don't know, Isaiah 37, an angel wipes out Sennacherib's army, um, the angel of the Lord. Now, we haven't even started talking well, the, about The that, angel but... of death, right, goes through, exactly. um, <laughs> kills all the firstborns exactly. uh, in Israel. Exactly. In, in, so, uh, Egypt, sorry. So <laughs> even there, and you mentioned it earlier when you talked about the kind of Victorian little girl angel that we get, because, of course... Funnily enough, in the scripture, all angelical kind of appearances are described in male terms. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that angels have gender. That's obviously, you know, a, a fallible kind of reading up from the human condition where we shouldn't. But it's just striking that they're never termed as, as, as women um, in scripture. They're never kind of given female pronouns, um, mm -hmm. feminine pronouns rather. Uh, so, you know, you, you've definitely got this sense in which we live with quite domestic angels, uh, cherubim, you know, I, uh, when, when my girls were really like tiny and chubby baby faced babies, you kind of think, oh, look at this little cherub. But that's not what cherubim are. In Genesis 3, there's a cherub <laughs> wielding the, the flaming sword. The cherubim are on the Ark of the Covenant um, on, on top of it. And they kind of are the throne between which 
the Lord is, is kind of sitting to rule over all things. Um, they play a very important part in the kind of temple furniture in that way. So, so the idea that cherubim are, you know, chubby babies, I mean, why would Adam and Eve not just push a chubby baby out of the way and, and get back into the garden? <laughs> they were blocked. Uh, and so I think that- the Flaming again, sword was really pulling most of the weight there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, and that's a safety hazard, giving a baby a flaming sword. Yeah, but right. there's something there about the, um, the, the our desire to domesticate that you hear when people talk about on the side of the angels, you know, someone's, oh, they're an absolute angel, uh, angelic smile. We've, we've sentimentalized and we've sentimentalized because again, I think we're seeking a place to lodge our metaphysical longings while being broadly committed to a secular reality. Um, and angels are a convenient receptacle for some of that. Um, yeah. I, uh, context i i did a little bit of my master's work looking at the study of angels angelology and i sent you my my paper luke and and one of the things i did to prepare for that was read a book by a, a lady emma hithcup james who, who basically compiled research on people who who claimed to have seen angels and it was fascinating that many of these people were not people of any kind of religious faith uh, they were people who, who kind of had an experience usually to do with trauma or bereavement, but sometimes just kind of unconnected to anything um, of, of a presence that they they, they knew with, with a kind of strong certitude was an angel. And um, I, I don't know if you've had experiences like that. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking. I, I might or might not. I'm not going to say on, on a YouTube channel. You have these moments which feel luminous, that feel beyond explanation. Uh, you have moments in which, you know, you talk about the kind of car crash you escape, I'm not surprised people are inclined to believe in an angel after an experience like that. I think that's not a faulty intuition. If you think about it, every day I'm alive is full of undeserved kindnesses. And it's only moments like that, which are such intense versions of that, that I suddenly start crediting to a source beyond just myself or sheer dumb luck. Uh, yeah. One of the interesting things to think about, so that passage you mentioned earlier, well, sometimes people have hosted angels they didn't mm. realize and 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 indeed the example you gave where that happened therefore whatever forms that angels might take one of them is so indistinguishable from yes. just yes. A, a regular person that you could run into in the street talk to them eat with them they leave you didn't even notice and it was an angel the entire time so it's pre i think it's pretty cool to think that you know people watching this they may have they may have yeah. run into an angel in their lifetime yes. seen him with with their own art could have happened today so right so so you know what you might be looking at a biblically accurate angel you don't know and i think that's the point is that that's that little verse in hebrews 13 verse 2 completely pulls the rug out from under our most sensationalist kind of soft focus glowing hollywood depictions because an angel could just be you or me, you know, and, and that I find it really interesting. So, um, you know, the Robbie Williams song Angels for one mm. or two years, I think it was the most popular song at funerals, although none of the funerals I've taken have requested it. What is that line? You know, I'm loving angels instead. Yeah. And it's really interesting. you can kind of flip that and say in Hebrews 13, we're say, being said, no, no, love people because of angels. Don't love angels instead of people. Love love people because of angels. And, and that's an interesting line. Again, when Jesus is talking about the life of the resurrection, why is it that the other side of death, when you're raised to, to a new and, and indestructible life, you won't marry or be given in marriage? Because you will be like the angels. Who knows what that means? But there's something about the angelic quality of life to which Jesus wants you and I to kind of aspire. Um, so the Bible wants us to welcome angels and actually we become hospitable towards our fellow human beings as we become like Abraham of old who did. And Jesus wants us to aspire to the kind of perfect worshipping life of the angels in heaven, which will be ours in the resurrection. Yeah. I was, I was just contemplating how thought through these lyrics actually are. Indeed. It's probably not, not worth that much study, but uh, it's an interesting song for sure. Um, I, I I was going to ask about 
a passage that you you may say actually has nothing to do with angels at all, but I'm just in, interested on your in your take of it. Um, so in Genesis six, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's the mention of the what is it? The sons of God yeah, who come really. down and have children with the daughters of humans, and then these these the offspring of these are known as these men of renown, the heroes yeah. of old. This 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 really fascinating passage. So one interpretation of the of who the the men in this circumstance are yeah. is that those were angels um what do you think about that yeah gosh <laughs> i mean that is one of those things where i i don't reach for that one first when i think about where angels are in the bible because there is okay. so, so much mystery in exactly what it means and there's a thing going on about the sons of um you know adam and uh, and and when the daughters of and the sons of god and just it, it it's starting yeah. to, to to pick up some of the genesis language about lineage so that as you go through genesis 1 to 11 you have these two lines there's a line coming down from from cain the line coming down from seth and uh, the, there's a clear sense in which you from the very beginning have a, an antithesis between them um and and it's it's kind of things fall in in line with either those who are the seed of the serpents who will be crushed in Genesis three and the, the seed of the woman who will, who will do the crushing. Um, so, so it's, it's stuff like that where I, I have read some really compelling readings of Genesis six where they aren't angels. And I've also read some where they are, and I'm really not hundred percent sure. I think I go back and forth on it. There are aspects of that, which, which I do think are well explained by the kind of angel um, thesis of course, these are not angels, strictly speaking, we're talking about. They're, they're demons, I guess. They're fallen angels. Um, this is not like what well-behaved angels are up to in Genesis 6. This is what their kind of gone bad cousins are up to. Um, yeah. I, think I, can, I think I can understand that that way. Can, can, can we dig into that a little bit? Because yeah. there's the fall that happens that we read about in Genesis, mm-hmm. the snake and the fruit yep. and, and cast out of the garden. Um, yes. And and then we see this, the snake seems to reappear in Revelation mm-hmm. as the, that ancient serpent and is much more identified with Satan. Yes. Um, and and mm-hmm. Satan is, you know, connecting these dots is, I, I think, actually slightly more difficult than, than you might that it might yeah. first appear, but yeah. like, in a sense, you could say that the snake in the garden mm. was already a fallen, created being before yes. humanity fell. Yes. And one of the distinctions between angels and humans is that that angels don't appear to have an opportunity for salvation. So there are angels who are still on yeah. God's side and we see lots of those referenced even by name. And then yeah. there are, there are also uh, demons who, as you reference, are fallen angels who have f- kind of followed Satan yeah. in, in his rebellion against God yes. and will not have the, op- they like the unrepentant humans, their ultimate destination is destruction. Mm. Um, mm. So, so do you th- do you think that well okay this is that's that's i want to throw a couple of things for you to like grab onto and and, mm. and pick up and run with um also the the humans are described as being created in god's image and and there's this special way in which Jesus came and died for humans. Mm. And yet, as you were describing in Hebrews 1, angels are being assumed to be an elevated creation ab- above humans. Yes. So, so why in the hierarchy are angels higher than humans if humans are uniquely created in the image of God? And then why uh, are angels not given... Uh, are, are, are they not allowed to share in Christ's death? I mean, I guess he came in human form. <laughs> could he? Could he not um, come in angelic form and and die and take the? the yes, these are deep questions, I guess. But uh... they are deep questions. Thank you. And I think 
I want to begin with a, a humble helping of I'm not God. So actually, I'm not sure I can really answer each one of those with the kind of conclusive authority that he will uh, when you are when you ask him, um, when you meet him. I, I think let's let's wind in, into some of those things. So one of them about, you know, angels in the hierarchy. Hierarchy is a good word. Do you know who invented it? Pseudo Dionysius, it all connects. No he introduces that word and that concept. And what's really interesting about the concept of hierarchy is when you and I use it, we tend to use it the other side of kind of all kinds of Marxist style analyses of power. So hierarchy equals bad, equals horrible pyramid, people at the top good, people at the bottom bad. Ah, it's not at all like that for Pseudo Dionysius. He's working with and adapting the kind of Neoplatonic idea of of the great chain of being and for him hierarchy is a reality in which those who are higher are positioned where they are for the good of everyone else in reality so the way god has designed the cosmos it is no shame to be a to be a, a rock um, it's no shame to be a cactus it's no shame to be a human being and it's no shame to be an angel. And there are different degrees of glory going on and different levels of, of reality. You know, the rock participates in, in, in physical existence, but it doesn't have life. The cactus has life, but it doesn't have life the same way that a, that a mouse does. A mouse doesn't have it the same way that, that you do. You don't have it the same way an angel does. Uh, an angel doesn't have a body. Uh, like you do and bodies have advantages but angels are able to do all kinds of things that um, you and I can't because of their disembodied spiritual reality okay so so that's just to say that's what a hierarchy is and so if we think of them as better and worse we've already made Satan's mistake by the way can I say I agree I endorse that narrative of an angelic fall before any human beings were around and that's one of the ways angels humble us because as you read the bible you suddenly realize we're kind of part of a bigger story, and it's very easy for us to put ourselves at the centre of it, but actually Christ is at the centre of it, to the glory of God. And so the more we look at that story, the more all these other things about angels are drawn in. Let me give you a, a really interesting example of that. Matthew 25, is it, where Jesus is talking about the, the sheep and the goats, is that right, um, in, in Matthew 25? Uh, um, and what you have there is this remarkable moment where the sheep, you know, stand for the righteous, uh, and the goats stand for the, the unrighteous. What does Jesus say um, in, in, in that parable, Matthew 25, to those who are unrighteous? I think you go down a bit, verse 41, maybe. What does he say to the goats? Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire that I have always wanted to throw you into. No, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's really interesting, isn't it? Flip back up, by the way. See what he says to the sheep. He doesn't say... Um, yeah, blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for the good angels from the foundation of the world. No, he says prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That asymmetry, by the way, I think you could write books about that. So when you look at the, the fate of, of, of the blessed, there is a sense in which you have a strong biblical theme of election. This was prepared in advance for them. When you look at those who are not, those who are cursed, it's not that God had been you know, gleefully rubbing his hands in eternity. That fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. And those who end up in it have thrown their lot in with him. Do you see? I think that's really interesting. So it's moments like that that suddenly make you go, wow, we're part of a bigger scheme of reality. We're not the only ones out there. Um, at which point it sounds like we're talking about aliens, doesn't it? And maybe we can talk about aliens because the angel-alien connection is, is, is way, way out there. But you can see why it's intuitively linked. OK, so what about the fall of angels and the fall of human beings? <sighs> Great theologians like... Thomas Aquinas, and he is great, would postulate that there's something about angelic reality that meant that the fall <coughs> that was carried out by these creatures of, of, of mind and will kind of immediately happened all at once. We were immediately, that they were immediately plunged into, into the consequences of their, of their rebellion. Um, they sinned kind of and, and fell all, all at once. Um, there's something about human beings that means that's just not what happens to us. In Genesis 3, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, yes, in terms of the spiritual death of being separated from God. But something about our creaturely mutability means we don't die straight away. Adam and Eve have quite a long time before they, they actually experience the fullness of, of death. Spiritual death begins that day as they're kicked out of the garden, away from the presence of the God who is life. Um, so that's usually one factor. Secondly, 
there's something kind of amazing about Jesus and the incarnation that you only get when you realize that the son of God did not choose to occupy one of these angelic realms of glory. That would have been a step down enough. <laughs> but he goes lower still to become, well, a human being, but, but lower still even a servant and lower still even a condemned criminal. So there's a sense in which because of that kind of hierarchical reality, we're meant to get what a breathtaking thing the incarnation even is, that that is what happened that that is what Jesus uh, was prepared to prepared to do. Um, what does that mean for angels? Are angels kind of being leapfrogged in this system? It, it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? And I guess, again, if you start thinking like that, you're probably on the devil's wavelength in which the world is full of finite resources. And, oh, if the humans are getting something, we're not getting something. You know, if God's on the throne, I need to be on the throne. That probably is the satanic mindset. But the angels who know the bliss of being with God they're just not even playing those kinds of egotistical, narcissistic games. And neither are the saints. You know, the, the more like Jesus we are, the less we're playing that kind of game where power is finite and more for me means less for you and so on. And so there's a sense which I think the angels who accompany the, 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 the story of salvation through scripture, they are on the edge of their seats. That's what 1 Peter 1 says. You know, angels long to look into these things. It's this wonderful thing where they love God and they are amazed at what he's doing and at time to time they're kind of like you know their angelic minds are blown by what god is doing you imagine them through the old testament being like where is this going god it's gonna be amazing to see and and from time to time one or two of them are entrusted with a special kind of scene that they get to act out gabriel goes to this young woman called mary i, I named our, our second daughter maria because actually there aren't enough protestant marys She's, a, she's an amazing older sister in the faith. And that moment is a really beautiful kind of um, kind of angel human encounter where Gabriel is overwhelming and, 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 and glorious and splendid. That's why he has to say, don't be afraid because it would be awesome to be in his presence. And yet he's clearly doing his master's bidding and recognizes that Mary is just the same. She says, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Um, so in that moment, in that room, both Gabriel and Mary, an angel and a human, are fulfilling their created role by being um, turned towards the Lord in, in worship and obedience. Um, so I think if, you know, if you start wondering why, why the angels being left out and, and, you know, why doesn't Jesus die for them? Um, those are not insensible questions. But in a sense, an angel can't die the way a human being can. And there's something about what Aquinas says is I think he's probably onto something that an angelic fall is different from a human fall. Um, also, this kind of explains why humans do fall. That's not to say it excuses it. You know, that's something Adam tries, you know, this garden has a snake in it. Come on, God, why has it got a snake there? But there's something there that actually the, the fall of Adam and, and Eve is in the context of, of, of a prior fall um, that's, that I think, yeah, it doesn't excuse, but it does help explain. You get a bit of that in Ezekiel, or is it 28 maybe, um, where you, yeah, you realize in this prophecy against one of the kings, the king of Tyre, um, Ezekiel delivers a word from God, which basically starts talking about this king of Tyre as if he is um, the, 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 the fallen angel in the garden. So if you, if you scroll down to verse 16, um, you, you get this remarkable detail about, um, uh, oh, is that verse 16? I don't mean that. A couple of verses earlier. Um, verse 14, anointed as a, as a guardian cherub or whatever. Um, just, just a strange thing that you have this kind of figure entrusted with an angelic role who, who falls. Now, again, Ezekiel 28, and I think there's a very similar bit in Isaiah uh, in the 30s. I can't remember exactly which. These are mysterious passages. And in the first instance, Ezekiel is, is speaking against the king of Tyre, but clearly this narrative, this backstory is being alluded to here. Um, uh, I think there are enough moments in the Bible where that backstory kind of just for a moment steps into the foreground for me to, to care about that and to know about that and to kind of rightly be located in reality by that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I wanted to pick up on another mysterious part of the Bible that you you just kind of mentioned in passing which is mm. uh in daniel 10 yeah. and yeah. what is it versus here right yes uh, 
um, he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came hmm. to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for uh, the vision is for days yet to come. Um, hmm. So this is an example, right, of literally th there hmm. seems to have been a protracted conflict with the kingdom of Persia for several days, tw 21 yeah. days. Um, and if you, you know, there's other passages in Daniel, I think, that, that describe things in similar terms. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if, you, if you extrapolate that this is not just a weird thing that happened once or twice, but actually was going on all the time, yeah. that angels are actually, you know, on the ground, like boots on the ground, as it were, right? God yes. is God is getting involved in human affairs in a way that you'd never consider. Um, and I guess maybe even to, to this day. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and, and that's another angle. So you talked a bit about guardian angels. And I think there's more in the Bible to argue for that than I used to think. Um, so we'll come back to that if you like. The other level, national or institutional or kind of what today we would fashionably call structural realities. The Bible is very keen to say that there are angelic entities that preside over, uh, represent, embody <laughs> some of those kind of abstract things like a nation um, or even a church, which is what Revelation 2 and 3 might be talking about when it talks about the angel of the church of if that doesn't mean the kind of human bishop or elder or whatever, it, it means that. So you do have these kinds of um, angelic forces at, at work in, in, in different kind of um, quantities. And clearly the, the Persians who were enemies of Israel, it wasn't just that there were human Persians and human Israelites, but actually at this angelic level, there were uh, forces at work there. And this is important because, and this is probably quite a controversial thing to say, um, Christians, when we encounter spiritual reality outside of the church, um, don't go, oh, that doesn't exist. That can't be. Um, we're actually saying, no, no, there is a spiritual realm full of, of potency and activity that is not of God. And that's why Paul can say in a throwaway comment uh, when he's talking to the Corinthians about food offered to idols, that the sacrifices of, of pagans are offered to demons, i.e. fallen angels. So that um, the, the kind of religious practices that were experienced by um, a, a pagan in the ancient world, Paul doesn't say they didn't exist. Uh, they weren't real. They didn't, they didn't happen. He says, no, no, there's a spiritual reality that's being tapped into there, but it's not the ultimate reality of God. It's the kind of secondary reality of um, these, these angels who are demons masquerading maybe as pagan gods or, or whatever, only too happy to receive that worship and to loom large in their worshippers' imaginations. Um, yeah. So, that actually complicates things because I think for, for people like me who perhaps, you know, I was an atheist at one point in my life and I just thought there was no spiritual realm at all. And then I was prepared to acknowledge like, you know, God and put, put, put one person in the spiritual realm. Um, I'm surprised to kind of think, actually, there is a, there is a spiritual reality behind all religions. Uh, Christians are not actually saying our religion is the only one that's spiritual. And, and no, no, actually all religions have a spiritual reality behind them. The question is, is, is it the ultimate spirituality of the God who creates all things, who has no rivals and no equals? Or is it this kind of competitor reality? The, um, I was gonna say like the Aldi version, but actually Aldi is often a lot better than everything else. <laughs> the kind of knockoff version of reality yes. that cannot give you what, what God can. Yeah, I think it's, if anything, listening to a couple of um, orthodox podcasts, which which put some interesting <laughs> ideas in my mind of um, what if Baal and all, all these Old Testament uh, <laughs> Moloch and uh, the, the the evil things that were being worshipped by the nations <laughs> surrounding Israel were, were not just, yeah, I think I had a similar assumption to you, which was that was just a superstition and expression of nothing mm. but what what if at the center of those dark and broken nations was an actual 
terrifying, powerful, miraculous demonic being who yes. they could go to and and see in person and was like giving them marching orders and and probably connected to that the thought of well what if there is something to this seemingly wild and crazy idea that you know deep in the heart of washington or whatever that there are, there are people communing yes. with with yes. actual demonic beings well and indeed getting, and and, and you know that way indeed and like this text is why is there an old testament ban on talking to the dead um mm. It's because God says don't do it. It's because time runs the way God wants it to. And the boundary between life and death is one which we are not to try to cross on our own. It's something he will carry us over. But it's not something, you know, the Bible doesn't say, because you know this just doesn't work. Um, look, I don't want to start talking about ghosts at this point. But like, there's there's all these spiritual realities in which, you know, why is it that we're, we're being forbidden from doing these things? I think secular convert Niv would have said because they're garbage how stupid you wouldn't do that it doesn't work you know everyone knows that Ouija boards are actually a parlor game from the 19th century etc you know here I come with my demystifying hat and the bible says actually reality is pretty pretty mystifying and there are all these things going on and you know I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to comment on you know the angelic realities being communed with in Washington or the deep state or anything but the Bible would lead me to understand that there is a, an angelic reality going on in all these institutions. So a, a good author is the 20th century writer, Charles Williams, who's a good friend of people like Tolkien and, and, and C.S. Lewis and others. He writes loads of books in which he's kind of probing at the, the, the link between human evil and angelic evil, human goodness and angelic goodness all under God. And probably the masterpiece in this genre wasn't written by him, but it's C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength which draws it all together in the most sublime way um, and leads you to see human institutions in, in, in that context. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, you wanted to come back to Guardian Angels at some point. What, what, I, don't, what your... I don't know if I really want to. But um... if, if, if there was a Guardian Angel assigned to each person, and there's got to be a like, vast number of, of angels, but maybe that's true. I, I guess yeah. I, I, I guess my mind is just wanting to assume that the humans are the most popular sentient creatures on the planet but no, indeed, you know, indeed. Maybe, maybe well, we, we have, and we have no guarantee that we're the only sentient creatures in the universe and it's really interesting because people sometimes say to me like you know do you think there's extraterrestrial life and i'm like yeah loads of it angels obviously and no one ever <laughs> thinks that's what i'm talking about but that is what we're talking about extraterrestrial life and again yeah, it, job the sons of the morning the stars, etc. There's a kind of connection where a lot of people read Genesis one and said the stars are the angels, or the angels are created about that time. So actually, there's there's a real layer there of kind of celestial reality participates in this kind of angelic reality as well, which works quite well in a kind of pre-Copernican universe um, and might be metaphysically true, even if it's not physically true. Okay, guardian angels. Well, I'm not convinced they exist. But I'm not going to rule them out because of Matthew 18, where Jesus talks about how these little ones are not to be made to stumble. Uh, one of the reasons um, that he talks about is that they're, they're little ones where well, he talks about how you have to go after them, even if they're lost little sheep. But yeah, up, up a bit, up a bit. Um, one of the reasons is because their angel always sees the face of the father in heaven. Oh, down a tiny bit. Bless you. Sorry. It's the next little uh, bit. Yeah, the lost sheep one. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Um, so that's not quite the same as like the angel on your shoulder, because clearly this angel is in heaven. But it does look like um, you have the beginnings of a guardian angel theology there. Also in Acts, where Peter is um, in prison, and he's miraculously let out by an angel and he knocks at the door and Rhoda kind of goes, oh, it's Peter and goes and tells everyone it's Peter. It doesn't open the door and they go, oh, I must be his angel. And go, oh, what does that mean? You know, and I guess then you have to go. Does Peter is Peter the only one with an angel? Uh, what if what if you have one? I don't know. It's like it's like secretaries in a in a company. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and so well, I guess you have to be an apostle or you know at least you know a pastor indeed. maybe gets a guardian angel. Indeed, but Matthew eighteen ten, it's these little ones, the nobodies, and the nobodies. Jesus says their angels always see the face of the Father in heaven. So the question can't be are there enough angels to go around? God is uh, an almighty creator. Of course there could be. Um, I guess the question is, what does the Bible say? Um, and why would it tell us something? And it's curious there, isn't it, that like well, yeah. the guardian angel stuff 
that I was so I as a child I went to a Roman Catholic church with my family that was basically a kind of like folklore superstition sentimental thing to make you feel good about the world you're a bit scared aren't you but don't worry you've got a guardian angel you're never alone now actually I've got God with me and God in me through the Holy Spirit so I mean that trumps an angel doesn't it when the Bible starts talking about these things, particularly here in Matthew 18, do you notice how ethical the, the outbox of that is? So Hebrews 13, what do we conclude from the fact that anyone might be an angel? Do hospitality. Um, here in Matthew 18, what do you conclude from the fact that these little ones have uh, an angel who sees the face of the father? Do not despise them, right? Let the reality of angels ethically instruct you for how you treat the nobodies in your church. There's something about the fact that the angels seem to be getting up with getting up to some fairly menial activities and quite earthy, like the fighting of battles, like the you know show up and deliver a news bit a bit of information, like you're the the post boy. Um, that's curious to me, and mm. you kind of think why why would an angel you know surely if they go to war they'll get it done in a day or or, or or not like why is it why is it this close run thing when and i guess partly the answer to that is that it's a mystery why god chooses any particular means to accomplish his goals um, yes for example yes. he chooses to include us in the building of his kingdom um, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and all the people were worshipping, we got an interesting insight into the counterfactuals of if nobody had been cheering, then the, the rocks would have cried out. So in the yeah, sense, indeed. the angels I, uh, are my involved. Wife, palm branches for my daughters to wave. Oh, yes. Now I've got them on the table. A, also the made it, reference that was. Which my wife told me is, is uh, well, my daughter told me this is a cult. <laughs> so, um, so you got the accurate and so we were, we we're waving this at dinner and saying hosanna hosanna um you're absolutely right and actually what's really interesting in that is that in luke's gospel the angels cry out at jesus's birth glory to god in the highest and in you know and then in in luke 19 with the triumphal entry you kind of have the human voices are the answering chorus they say peace in heaven and glory in the highest you have this glory and peace glory and peace and they're like brackets about jesus coming into the world and coming into the city and it's like angels and humans are, are joining in the chorus together um which by the way is quite comforting because you kind of think what happens when you go to your church and they're like three of you mm -hmm. one honest answer is there aren't just three of you you are joining in with something colossally significant in which uh, you know with angels and archangels you're praising guys that's really special <laughs> um I think about this all the time. Revelation tells us in chapter one that John has a vision on the Lord's Day, you know, Sunday. And yet on this one day of the week, he gets a vision into chapter four, how everything is always happening in heaven. Right. I think that's meant to be lived out in my experience on the Lord's Day. In one day of the week, I gather with his people and the veil is pulled back and I get a glimpse into the glory of, of God who is forever worshipped by these angels saying, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Um, so, yeah, menial tasks that angels are doing. Yeah, great, great thought. And, and why is it such a close run thing? Well, part of it is, I think, partly to assure us that um, some of the, the forces in play here are massive. You know, um, I think about Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God in which he basically talks about the devil and how we have a foe who is far stronger than we are. Um, and, uh, you know, did we in our own strength confide, we surely will be losing. You know, you can't beat the devil, is what Martin Luther says. But don't worry, because God has smashed him. You don't have to worry about the one who's been defeated by, by Christ. It's a I actually think if Christians got their theology of demons from um, this hymn, they'd do pretty well. There you go. For still our ancient foe doth seek to wake, work us woe on earth is not his equal um it's delightful it always yeah. amuses me when we sing this because it's such a departure from the way that we mostly talk <laughs> that everybody's yeah. standing there singing about uh yes. his rage we can adjure for lo his doom is sure <laughs> one the world it's shall fell him ah! yeah it's, <laughs> it's brilliant. a different yeah. like tone from most of the way that we think and I, I guess if you went and listened to 
if you if you if you listened to a Martin Luther sermon, mm. then it would match much more closely with this sentiment. <laughs> so yes. getting more of a a flavour of Christendom as expressed during that that time. Absolutely. In Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, so I, I've got a book by a guy called um, Romeo Dallaire, Lieutenant General, UN, oh, I can't remember his exact rank, but <laughs> one of the people in the UN who went to Rwanda, the book is called Shake Hands with the Devil. And he, he's kind of asked, like, how can, how can I still believe in God? And he says, well, I believe in God because I believe in the devil. And I shook hands with him in Rwanda. And so there's a sense in which even in our kind of secular world, we find our way to this insight, um, uh, you know, when Martin Luther sings this world with devils filled. You know, I think there are moments even in a kind of post everything world where we start realizing that this world is with devils filled and that sometimes human beings do things of, of, such, a, of such an evil tenor that we're suddenly only able to talk in these kinds of cosmic terms. Yeah. I also kind of love the idea that some of these seemingly straightforward missions, like you just you've got to go and talk to Mary, for example. Yeah. If you if you knew the full story, would be like an epic Mission Impossible thing mm -hmm. where they were dodging around demons and doing all kinds of subterfuge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, 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 indeed, indeed, there's a whole level here. I, I, one of the things I find really interesting when you talked about like why is it a close run thing? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. So Revelation 12, we have a, a, a narrative of that angelic fall, um, and what's really interesting there is that the d the dragon and his angels fight against uh, you know God, and God doesn't fight back. He doesn't need to. In some ways, um, he, he he can let his servants get on with it. Um, so if you scroll down a bit to verse sort of seven, war breaking out in heaven, you know, Michael and his angels do it. And what's really funny, by the way, is what Michael's name means. It means who is like God. Um, that's funny on two levels. One, God doesn't have to fight the devil because he's too strong he'll send someone else someone who's a bit like him i suppose but oh. also i guess in in the kind of classical imagination the devil has wanted to be like god and so michael's name adds insult to injury well who can be like god not you out you get um and it's very curious you know the dragon and and his angels fight back but they can't win and they're not even fighting against god um yeah, but what's really interesting is the way God triumphs over the powers and principalities, over all these angels, or over the spiritual forces of darkness, is not through an angelic sword. It's through human hands stretched out on a cross. You see that in Colossians 2, that that is how Christ, that's how God disarms the, the, the enemy. Um, that's how he how he wins. And that, I think, is interesting because it shows that even though God has angelic forces beyond compare indeed jesus says this you know could i not have called twelve thousand legions of angels he asks in matthew's gospel um when when his his disciples are trying to keep him from from this you know or, or in john you know my kingdom's not of this world my, my kingdom my servants could have fought for me even though god has unmatched angelic power he chooses to triumph at the cross through ultimate weakness and human weakness specifically because it was human weakness that that brought all things down into um, into into the fall. By the way, that's an answer back to that previous question about angelic fall versus human fall. Something about humans is that we seem to have been created with a load-bearing role in everything. So the angels have a very significant role, but but humans image God in a way that means made to to steward, to rule, to have dominion over creatures. When we fell, everything else was plunged into a groaning creation. That doesn't seem to have been the case with the fall of the angels. You know, it was possible for them to have fallen, for Adam and Eve to have been unfallen. Uh, however, the other side of Adam and Eve's fall, the world is, is put into this Romans 8 um, condition of being frustrated and needing to be released. Yeah, to go back to your comment about the the weakness and the, the significance of the cross. Um, there's this funny way in which the there was a reliance on evil for Jesus to be put on the cross, right? The, it, it was necessary for the hands of evil men, yeah. Judas, the etc. Et um, 
for Jesus to suffer and die. And through that is how the ultimate uh, victory over death was, was, was achieved. Um, but you kind of, I, I always thought this is a really fascinating mystery is what did the forces of darkness think was happening at that moment? Because yeah, it, it just takes like remarkable stupidity to think that you're yeah. going to have victory over an yes. omnipotent being, but I, which but is which kind of why some of the of the, how yeah. pride blinds you, I guess. Hundred percent, and and this is why some of the early church fathers talk about the devil is a, a greedy, like sea beast that grabs at some bait and then ends up getting destroyed because of it. His his, his kind of um, uncontained appetite. You're absolutely right. Um, John twelve, Jesus talks about that the prince of this world. And it's it being his hour, but actually he's 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 being he's being driven out in this moment. So the prince of this world is actually thrown down at the cross, but doesn't realize it because again, if you have a satanic mindset, then you can only see the cross as a horror and a hatred. And anyone you see on a cross, you have clearly destroyed. <laughs> Right, you win. That's that's the thing. So Satan must have thought that he'd done a brilliant job through Judas. He'd managed to steer things this way because Satan doesn't understand real power. He doesn't understand it. Um, he 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 can only see things a certain way. From that perspective, the cross looks like the most unexpected coup, right? Um, right. And what he doesn't realize is. That actually there is a different kind of power. Again, to talk about C.S. Lewis, and perhaps this would be a good note to draw things together. I don't know. This is in *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*. The the White Witch knows her magic, and she's much more powerful than any of the humans in the story. But Aslan will talk about a deeper magic, and 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 translate that out of magic and Narnia. And the point is, the devil knows power, and he's got lots of it. He doesn't know the deepest power of all. Power so powerful that you could let go of it that you could dispense with it entirely, that you could give it away on the cross. And in that moment of weakness, triumph. It's funny, it's funny that you mention uh, magic, because I, I, I was having similar thoughts and that, yeah, I think this is a, this is a great place to finish. Um, that p people talk about how disenchanted the, the world is for the modern man, that everything we used to believe in hid in the, the cracks of our knowledge. And now that we've, We've mapped mm. the whole world and we've explained every phenomena in scientific terms. Then uh, there's no magic left, and even Christians have a sort of de disenchanted view of of the world themselves. Quite often, I think, and, and I think it's it's great to talk about these things just as a reminder that actually the world is full of, and that not the world, right? The the universe existence. Is full of all kinds of mysteries mm. and exciting and powerful and magical things that that are just beyond our ken, and 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 the, these are things we also are told to pray about and fight in, like in the context of, like we're not fighting against human powers, but against the, this, you know, spiritual realms. So this is this is not just a a thing we read about like it's a foreign country like this is this is the battle for which we are being recruited into god's army for mm. yeah well th thank you very much for joining me niv everybody in chat was very much enjoying oh. listening to you so <laughs> oh great what a joy what a joy to be with you luke great thanks everybody